Okay. So now with that background on the anatomy of the spinal cord and its organization, um, I think we're ready to trace the flow of information to um, and from the cortex. So from primary sensory neuron to primary somatosensory cortex. And again, this is something we've all seen in multiple courses over the years um, in undergraduate uh, neuroscience um, and physiology, but it's the level of detail varies. So we know that somatosensory information from the body enters the CNS via two main ascending systems. The first is the dorsal column medial lumniscus system, uh, named for the two um, tracks, so that it travels in the dorsal columns of the spinal cord and the medial lumniscus of the brainstem. The second is the anterolateral system, and so um, it travels anterolaterally throughout the spinal cord and the brainstem. This is also referred to as the spinal thalamic tract, is how you may know it. I'd like you to switch gears and think of it as the anterolateral system because it actually involves multiple tracts that are not all spinal thalamic. And so the general thing you have to think about for this is what are the neuroanatomical steps in the flow of somatosensory information from PNS to CNS? And the general flow, very grossly, is from um, primary sensory neuron in the dorsal ganglion. I'm putting in this in here because I would write it in here. Um, primary sensory neuron in the DRG to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord uh, with or without a synapse to um, the um, medulla with or without a synapse to the VPL thalamus to the somatosensory cortex. And the asterisk is, is here to remind me, to remind you, that sensory information from the head and face enters via the cranial nerves, um, enters the CNS via the cranial nerves. Goodness, that's an acronymic disaster. Um, and they, um, that information projects to the VPM, ventral postural medial, ventral postural medial thalamus, not the VPL. So we'll come back to that and we'll talk about the sensory inflow from the cranial nerves in exquisite detail, but just remember that somatosensory information from head and face enters via cranial nerves. Somatosensory information from the body enters via the spinal nerves. And so the flow from primary sensory neuron to dorsal horn to brainstem to thalamus to cortex is similar but not identical for these two main pathways. And you can see this is a subset. This is the spinal thalamic tract, which is a subset of the anterolateral system. And this is the dorsal column system. And so we normally think of these as columns but now you know there's also columns in the gray matter of the spinal cord. So where are the main differences where you want to focus your attention? Number one is where the information crosses the midline in the nervous system. And again, most of this should be reviewed for most of you. Um, so the dorsal column system, the information crosses in the level of the medulla, where the system changes from being a dorsal column system to a medial lumniscus system in the brainstem. And in the spinal thalamic or anterolateral system, more correctly, the information crosses at the level of the spinal cord, at or near the level at which it enters the spinal cord. And so that's a major difference. The second major difference and related to that is the location of the second order sensory neuron. So the second order sensory neuron of the anterolateral system is in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, whereas the second order sensory neuron of the dorsal column system is in the medulla, right? Either in the nucleus cuneatus for input from the arm or the nucleus gracilis for input from the leg. So those are the two main differences between the systems. Now, in terms of most clinically relevant somatosensory function. We're talking about information from the external surface of the body, from the skin to the central nervous system. 
And all of you by now are familiar with dermatomes. So regions of the skin innervated by a single spinal nerve. Uh, and these are really useful clinically because they provide diagnostic information about localizing a lesion in the core. Now you can see from this detailed dermatome map a few things. The first is that the face is supplied by the cranial nerves, which you already know, but just a reminder, not by the cervical spinal nerves. The second is the sort of shape of the dermatomes, which tends to be longitudinal on the limbs or more longitudinal or at least oblique and transverse on the trunk. Um, and the third is that there's a number of clinically relevant, really useful ones. So this is the picture I think from your book. And you know, instead of, I mean, it's open book testing anyway, instead of memorizing them, think about these really important levels and how you might use them. You can see one of the great sort of horrible things, great cruel tricks of, of evolution is that the most caudal levels of spinal cord are some of the things, the sensation that we hold the most dear. Um, so the bottom, bottom of the spinal cord innervates uh, things like the rectal sphincter and the genitals. And so almost all spinal cord injuries um, disrupt that sensation, which is hugely problematic for function. Um, the second thing I want you to think about for each, um, when we're talking about sensory information, these three things that are noted in your book. So you have the modality of the information. Is it touch or temperature? Those are examples of modalities. You have the quality of information. If it's touch, is it uh, light touch or deep touch? If it's temperature, is it hot or cold? Those are quality. And then you have location. And so you know that each um, individual um, in addition to dermatome, the dermatome map gives you a, a coarse map of, of location just by spinal nerves. And then the second level um, of location, or perhaps the smallest level of location, has to do with receptive field. So each primary afferent has a single receptor, uh, receptive field on the skin, um, and that gives you information about location. So every time you get sensory information, it's you get information about modality, quality, and location of the stimulus. I think we did sort of all of these. And so you can see how um, some of these give you really good information. So the nipples are about um, T4 and the umbilicus is T10 and so on. And so um, you can get some pretty good information about the level of damage from these dermatomal levels. This um, just summarizes a whole bunch of things. I know Sam talked a little bit about peripheral receptors, so I won't belabor this, but just summarizes a whole bunch of information about uh, the receptor tub subtype, pardon me, relating to the type of skin stimulus, um, the type of afferent response physiologically. Is it rapidly adapting? Um, and is it low threshold? So in the case of these hair follicle receptors, um, they are rapidly adapting, they turn off quickly, and they're very low threshold. So this is a light brush of your hair on your arm with a feather, for example. Conversely, um, slowly adapting receptors stay on. In the case of pain receptors, they stay on persistently uh, to tell us that something is, is damaging us, even after that stimulus is removed. Um, and they're high threshold, not low threshold. So you need an injurious or potentially injurious force to turn them on. The receptive field is different too. And so this tells you about the size of the rece receptive field for each of these things. And for something like a Pacinian corpuscle um, that detects vibration, it has a relatively large receptive field. And you can reverse that to a Merkel cell complex where each individual little receptor has a very small receptive field. And so all of these things together, giving us information um, from different types of receptors with different res electrophysiological physiological properties and different receptive fields, 
come together to give us the uh, sensory detection repertoire that we have. And so this is really evident in the hand. I just wanted to emphasize this. This is a figure from the book. And so um, in the hand, the there's a relationship between spatial resolution, your ability to distinguish two points, um, and the density of sensory receptors in the skin. And so the palm of the hand has the lowest um, density and the lowest spatial resolution. And as you move distally in the phalanges or in the fingers and the digits, um, increasingly distally, you get an increasing density of the receptor representation in the skin and spatial resolution increases in parallel. And so spatial resolution is the ability to detect two points. And this is greatest at the tips of the fingers. And as you move proximally in the limb continues to decrease. Now, most of us have a picture like this about um, the spinal nerves and the motor axons. And we we're gonna work to get a little bit beyond this in 426, I hope. And so, you know, we appreciate that. Um, there's axons and motor nerves, innervate muscles. There's uh, sensory receptors that enter here and they coalesce in mixed nerves distal to the dorsal ganglion. Um, and so I'll just talk through a few things. This is the schematic we all often come to the course with in our heads. This is more what it actually looks like. So this is a memorang slide. So this X is the dorsal um, or posterior gray horns. And actually the, the dorsal roots or posterior roots actually um, coalesce or enter the cord as a whole bunch of rootlets. And similarly, the ventral roots arise from um, a whole bunch of ventral rootlets that exit the cord. And I say enter and exit to represent the flow of information. And so it kind of looks like this inside the dura where these ventral roots exit. And it looks this is another representation just to show you where everything is and emphasizing that the dorsal roots as they enter fan out into rootlets and the ventral roots form from a, a section of rootlets and this is the diagram from your book that shows that with the dura and the arachnoid pulled back now and you can see the dorsal rootlets and the ventral rootlets here and this is exactly what it looks like. So this is a posterior view of the cord showing you um, the posterior dorsal roots with the dura reflected. Now the asterisks in this, this is actually an anatomical cadaveric study and the asterisks, are, asterisks my goodness, are showing you um, where there's actually some communication between levels. So there's little roots that actually have this dorsal root is entering the cord but it's bringing in information like a y from that level and that level um this looks like cervical roots so i'm not sure exactly what level we're at but uh so this paper is actually questioning the perfect segmental organization of the cord but the point i want you to get is that it isn't just a root it's a whole bunch of rootlets and they enter at what's called the dorsal root entry zone this, sorry, gory picture should give you a bit of a warning. If we zoom in, I just want to give you an idea of how small dorsal root ganglia are. So here, this is the posterior view, posterior view of the spinal cord. The pins are in the dorsal root ganglia and the bone is sawed off. They're measuring angles here, but that's not important. They've sawed off the vertebral bodies to re re reveal the dorsal root ganglia in between them. And the biggest one is at the lumbar level. It's about six millimeters wide. So these are tiny in humans, six millimeters wide. Um, this is the dura is intact here. So all of this is enclosed in the dural sac. The spinal cord has its dura on. And this is a really important point. So a terrible diagram important point like really this is a muscle with tendons my goodness so 
yes, bad diagram. I apologize to the authors, but I like the point they make. And the point is this, that in that dorsal ganglion, which is this little tiny sub-centimeter structure here nestled between vert vertebrae, um, are all populations of sensory neurons. So this is a very diverse structure. So proprioceptors from, heaven forbid, this muscle and tendon, um, and mechanoreceptors and nociceptors in the skin all come together in this very heterogeneous DRG. And they travel, extend axons together um, in the dorsal roots. And then there's some sorting in the dorsal horn. So remember back to the beginning about those columns in the gray matter. And the sorting is that smaller, um, uh, smaller sensory axons tend to terminate more superficially in the dorsal horn, whereas progressively larger sensory axons have progressions, um, projections that penetrate deeper into the dorsal horn. And of course, proprioceptors sometimes extend uh, a branch to synapse with uh, motor neurons in the ventral horn. This differential sort of ingrowth in development of these different populations is mediated by differential um, expression of receptors for growth factors on the neurons themselves. So these axons respond to different trophic cues and that patterning is set up in development. That's the point of this figure, but I just wanted to emphasize the diversity of the population of all the sensory neurons in the dorsal ganglion and how they project to different levels of the spinal gray matter. Okay, now, 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 with all of that, we are getting to the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. So this pathway carries information about vibration, proprioception, and fine touch. And I've put a little reading about the neurological exam um, into this module, and you certainly don't read the whole thing, but if you read the sensory testing portion, it will give you some ideas of how um, you will test this, and more importantly, the types of test results you'll encounter in cases if you haven't seen this type of thing before. Um, so the tests on the neurological exam for this pathway are tests of vibration and light touch. And specifically, you do that with a tuning fork um, or something like a cotton swab, like a Q-tip. So those would be the tests you would use to test the integrity of the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. Now, in these diagrams in your book, um, you can see this is represented here by a Pessinian corpuscle. And you can see that the levels are taken here from the cervical spinal cord here and ascending next is the caudal medulla, rostral medulla, pons, midbrain, and finally um, the cerebrum, thalamus, and cortex. And so you can follow the progression of these pathways all the way from primary receptor to um, primary cortex. And that's what we're going to do. Now I've taken a couple of pictures here to emphasize a couple of things that people have trouble visualizing. So I like this, this is a very old uh, image and I know it is because it's called the kinesthesia tract, which is the, uh, the very old name for proprioception. Um, and so, but that's okay because it makes the following point. So now you can see, I hope, that as white matter is progressively added from input at every level, sacral, lumbar, thoracic, and cervical, um, that the dorsal columns increase in size as you move rostrally. So remember that uh, sacral spinal cord that had very little small fasciculus gracilis? Um, now it adds fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus comes in at the thoracic cervical levels, and then you end up with this big, large dorsal funiculus. Um, you can see that all of them synapse the nucleus gracilis carrying proprioceptive input from the legs and the nucleus cuneatus from the upper limb and cross um, at the decussation in the caudal medulla and past this decussation point, this is the transition from dorsal columns to medial lemniscus, which then ascends and synapses with somatotopy predictably in the primary somatosensory cortex. This is a yucky picture, and I realize that. Sorry, it's obviously from a very old textbook. 
but it emphasizes a couple of points that people miss. So the first is that, again, fasciculus gracilis, most medially, contains only input from the lower limbs. It continues medially and input from the upper limbs is added as fasciculus cuneatus. Both of those um, synapse in the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus respectively and decussate across the midline and then ascend as the medial lemniscus to the pons or puente, which is Spanish for pons, I assume, because I got this from a Spanish article. Um, and at the level of the pons is when information from the face about similar modalities, light touch and proprioception is added. And so traveling in parallel with this from cranial nerve nuclei is added information and it all travels in this column and recall, I don't know why my mouse is, I have to like make weird hand movements. Um, recall that that face information terminates in the VPM while the body information terminates adjacently in the VPL, but they're traveling together in parallel. And I just want to get that additive contribution from legs to arms, synapse, and then face prior to setting up the brainstem. Now, so we know that sensory information, we'll break that down into steps. Down here at the level of the spinal cord, we have sensory information entering the cord and the tract ascends ipsilaterally in the spinal cord, in the dorsal columns. They synapse in the caudal medulla, arms in the nucleus cuneatus, information from the legs in the nucleus gracilis. I remember um, great legs. This, I don't know why I remember that. That's my mnemonic. Um, the secondary sensory neurons of this pathway exit those nuclei in the medulla um, and cross. And the name of that decusation is important. So this is the internal arcuate, arcuate, my goodness, fibers in the caudal medulla. And they ascend as the medial lemniscus through the whole brainstem. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of the brainstem. Um, and that's important. And as I said, they synapse on... Um, VPL thalamus. And finally, the tertiary neurons of this pathway exit VPL thalamus and synapse on the primary somatosensory cortex via the internal capsule. Now, the somatotopy of the internal capsule remains an active area of research, so you're going to see different um, rat explanations of this. Most sources report that this is the, the, the way things work in the internal capsule. So we've already talked about this for motor, that starting at the genu, it sort of goes face, arms, legs, represented in, these are the capitals, the motor limb of the internal capsule and the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And now we'll layer on the sensory information, which is generally considered to be in the posterior portion of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So the lowercase letters here represent the sensory information from the face, the arm, and the leg, respectively. And so we've got in the posterior limb, motor anterior relative to sensory. And that is sort of the consensus viewpoint. You may find alternate um, information about that, but that's what we're going to roll with uh, for the purposes of the course. Now, I want you to just recall, we've talked about this, a small internal capsule stroke can produce some of the same signs and symptoms as a relatively large cortical stroke. Um, so you need much less ischemic territory within the capsule to produce the same effects as a cortical um, ischemia. And there's no cortical sign involvement. These are the cortic some cortical signs. So there's no cortical sign involvement if the stroke is restricted to the internal capsule, and you can now layer in sensory function in the same way. So a posterior, um, a stroke involving the posterior limb of the internal capsule could include some, will likely include some sensory deficits as well as motor deficits. When you talk about aphasia, make sure you can distinguish between aphasia 
which is a cortical sign, and dysarthria, which is a pure motor sign. So make sure you have that distinction down. Okay. Now the somatotopy, as we've already alluded to a little bit, um, in we talked about it in the gray matter, where there's a proximal, uh, pardon me, distal to proximal arrangement generally um, in the ventral horn. In the white matter, there's also somatotopy. So if we look at the pathway we just saw for the gracilis, uh, fasciculus, gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus, um, it again, of course, roughly goes leg most medial to occiput and neck most lateral in those dorsal columns. And in the anterolateral system, it's um, ventral to dorsal instead of lateral to medial. So the leg is most anterior and most ventral and the head and neck, well, I guess is the neck, is most um, dorsal in that intralateral system for pain and temperature. Okay, so let's talk about that system now. So the intralateral system again contains three tracks. Um, it carries information about crude touch or, or deep touch, um, pain and temperature. And so not all of this information, this mechanical sensation is unpleasant, but it tends to be more forceful touch than uh, it is more forceful touch than the low threshold receptors, I'm lightly stroking my hand, uh, of the um, dorsal column medial lumniscus system. Now there's actually three tracts that I want you to be aware of here. The main tract is still the spinal thalamic tract, but the other two have important repercussions for pain processing. So the spinal thalamic tract is the best known tract. Um, and it mediates the discriminative aspects of pain and temperature sensation. What do I mean by that? I mean, which modality uh, is this and where is it on my body? What is happening? Location and intensity. So modality and quality. And so they synapse in the VPL thalamus, but on distinct neurons from the DCML, it's the dorsal column medial lumniscus pathway. So these two pathways don't impinge on the same um, tertiary neurons in the thalamus, and that's important. <clears throat> the spinal reticular tract is a little tract um, in the pons. So the spinal reticular tract, and, and the spinal reticular tract, and this is important, is named spinoreticular because it's not just a little branch of the spinal thalamic. It contains axons that travel all the way from at least the spinal dorsal horn to the reticular formation in the pond. So it's not just this little branch, it actually is spino reticular system. And Sam will talk more about the reticular system in terms of sleep and arousal later in the course, but this is the tract um, that causes you to pay attention to pain, right? So it, it, pain is a qualitative experience. It's not just the detection of sensory stimulus. It's also the mental associations and emotional reaction you have to that stimulus. And so the spinal reticular tract is really important for that. The spinal mesencephalic tract similarly um, is, is, uh, travels from the spinal cord dorsal horn to um, areas in the more rostral uh, brainstem in the midbrain, it, including and notably the periaqueductal gray. So this gray matter which can, um, surrounds the cerebral aqueduct. And the periaqueductal gray is a crucial region for mo central modulation of pain. So pain is not determined by the intensity of the stimulus, um, but by our emotional, which I'm highlighting here in the spinal reticular tract um, and our emotional reaction to the pain um, and our ability to centrally modify the experience of the pain. And so um, we'll get into that perhaps in more detail later, but, but those are important things. So spinal thalamic, spinal reticular, and spinal mesencephalic. Yeah. 